For this video, let's cover five techniques and concepts about audio compression, with each chapter becoming increasingly complex. We'll start off simple, but by the end of the video, I'll ask a question about compression that I haven't been able to figure out, and I doubt I will, so hopefully someone here is smart enough to offer some insight on it. With that said, let's cover five compression techniques and concepts from simple to complex. Starting simple, let's discuss using compression for EQ and gain staging. Now, when analog mastering was more common, this was used a lot more often, but it's still pretty valuable. In short, if a mastering engineer had a really great sounding compressor, but the track didn't need compression, they'd leave the peaks alone, but still use the unit for subtle timbre shaping and gain staging. Most digital compressors lack the nuance for this, but two good options that I've found are Eventide's Omnipressor and Tokyo Don Lab's Molotok, the latter being free if you're interested. The Omnipressor, with a 1 to 1 ratio and no measured compression or expansion, still introduces a strong third order harmonic. More noticeably, it maximizes the signal pretty significantly. By adjusting the input and the output, I can control the level of maximization and prepare the signal to hit the next processor, whatever that might be. The Molotok, again with no measured attenuation, introduces something similar to a 6 dB per octave high pass filter, which, although it looks aggressive, is subtle enough for mastering with only about 0.5 dB attenuated at 50 Hz. Additionally, everything above 200 Hz is boosted by 0.2 dB, while the air is boosted by about 0.3 dB. Very subtle, but when you're mastering, little changes like this make a difference. The harmonics are much more aggressive though, with both even and odd overtones at high amplitudes. Now hopefully, in the future more digital compressors impart unique timbres when peaks aren't attenuated, but for now, these are two good options. Let's check out the difference that Omnipressor makes without the compressor or expander engaged. Next up, let's cover gain riding parallel compression. So this is another compression technique that's kind of been lost. In short, parallel compression, in particular aggressive parallel compression, isn't a set it and forget it situation. Depending on the instrumentation, pumping will become more or less noticeable at various points in the song. With that in mind, it's a good idea to find the settings that you like for parallel compression and then listen to the track from start to finish. Meanwhile, take notes on any sections in which you notice some audible pumping. Then using automation, reduce the output gain of the compressor during those sections. Alternatively, if the compressor is on an auxiliary track, automate the channel fader during those passages. Now personally, I enjoy using the latch function and manually adjusting the aux track's level as the song plays. Once I get a good performance, so to speak, I'll switch the automation to read. The minor inconsistencies give it a little bit more character. Moving on and getting a little bit more complex, let's cover an experimental parallel harmonic compression technique. Now speaking of parallel compression, we can combine a few concepts to create a technique that's both creative and practical. One of the best parts of parallel compression is the additional overtones. Typically, the more aggressive the compression, the more pronounced the wave shaping, resulting in higher amplitude harmonics. Now the only issue is that the compressor is wave shaping based on the waveform's peak, which may or may not be musically related to the song. For example, the peak could be vocal sibilance or something along those lines. To create more musical parallel compression, or parallel compression in which the overtones are more often tied to the song's key, let's create our auxiliary track and first insert a linear phase EQ. Then we'll find the fundamental frequency, which should be the root note of the song's key. So let's say the song is in the key of A minor, meaning the fundamental is A. Or if I didn't know this, I could observe the analyzer, pinpoint the highest amplitude, low frequency, and this will likely be the root note. Now with a bell filter, I'll amplify this fundamental a fair amount. We're going to compensate for this later on, so you can make this boost pretty aggressive without worrying too much. Now, I also like to find the perfect fifth and boost that. If you're more music theory leaning, you'll know that this note is E, but if you're like me and you're more geared towards numbers, you could use the ratio of 3 to 2, which will always give you a perfect fifth. For example, if the fundamental is 55 Hz, we could multiply 55 by 3, resulting in 165. Then, divide 165 by 2 to find the frequency of the perfect fifth. In this example, the frequency is 82.5 Hz, which again is E. It's just a different way of finding the same thing. Now once that's boosted, insert your compressor of choice for the parallel compression 
and compress heavily. With in-key elements boosted, it's much more likely that the wave shaping occurs to in-key elements, resulting in harmonics that are musically related. After the compression, insert another linear phase EQ and attenuate the fundamental and the perfect fifth until the signal sounds balanced. So basically this is an emphasis, de-emphasis technique used to create more harmonious parallel compression. Let's take a quick listen to it. Make mixes that accurately translate what you hear in your head without years of practice or expensive plugins. Seriously though, when people work with us, they get results. That's why major industry professionals like Keith Urban's producer Aaron Schurz works with us, Grammy Award winning AJ Castillo, Billboard number one charted artist Megan Lindsay, Grammy Award winning artist Tulis, The Voice singer Cody Ballou, Grammy nominated producer Tyler Kane, Warner Music artist Ricky Young, and the list goes on. Why waste your time creating mixes that look like this when you can instantly fix the problem by working directly with professionals who have already done what you're trying to do? Watch this entire video and at the end, learn how you can start making mixes that accurately translate what you hear in your head. Moving on, let's cover lossy compression and side image artifacts. So we're talking about a different type of compression here, not peak compression, but the compression used to encode a track from WAV to MP3, AAC, etc. Now there's an issue with a lot of mixes that I'm noticing, but it's rarely talked about. Basically the decorrelation of high frequencies causes more artifacts when the track is converted into a lossy format than if the high frequencies were correlated. Now by decorrelated, I mean the left and the right channels have differing information. By correlated, I mean the left and the right channels have identical information. Now this is becoming more of an issue with stereo expander plugins. For example, if I use this Isotope Imager plugin and expanded the highs significantly, then when the track is converted for Spotify, YouTube, etc., it's a lot more likely that I'll hear those weird artifacts associated with lossy formats. Now a big part of reducing file size when encoding is attenuating high frequencies. If we compare the same section of a song, one that's a 320 kilobits per second MP3, the other a 24-bit 48 kilohertz wave, notice how much high frequency information is lost. And that's a high quality MP3 bounced out from the DAW. Now when artifacts are created from the left and the right channels identically, they're much more likely to be masked by other high energy centered information. But if the artifacts occur on the side image, there's a lot less there to mask them. Additionally, now they're providing spatial and directional cues to help them stand out. Long story short, stereo expansion is fine within reason, but know that the more that you decorrelate high frequencies, the more aggressive the artifacts will become after encoding. Last up, let's talk about what is maybe the future of compression. But that depends on if somebody can figure this out. So the fast Fourier transform has been an absolute game changer for audio processing. If you're unfamiliar, it takes EEG data and it converts it into phase, amplitude, and frequency data that could then be assigned to bins or chunks of information. For example, Isotope RX is an FFT editor. It maps out the bins with the X axis representing time and the Y axis representing frequency and then variable colors representing changes in amplitude. Now I've made some more in-depth videos about this, but in short, allocating the information this way allows for much more accurate changes to amplitude of these bins when compared to traditional EQ. So, my question that I haven't been able to find any info on, is it possible to rearrange these bins so that the X axis still represents time, but the Y axis becomes the amplitude? If the amplitude information is already known and it can be mapped, then if the bins were arranged in the way that I just described, then sections of the dynamic range could be easily selected and then adjusted. Now what's interesting is this is already possible with a traditional FFT editor, it's just not optimized for it based on the way it's mapped out. But by rearranging the bins, compression, expansion, maximization, gating, and any other manipulation of the dynamic range could be done incredibly accurately and without the need for a threshold function. So say for example I have a noisy track, traditionally I'd use a gate to attenuate or downward expand the noise whenever the performance wasn't present. Now this works, but the noise is still present when the performance occurs. Additionally, 
gates can be finicky with the attack and the release, ratio look ahead, etc. And noticeable artifacts definitely pose a problem. With a rearrangement of the bins that organize them based on time and amplitude, I could select all the info between, say, negative 140 dB and negative 80 dB and significantly reduce the gain. This reduction would occur whether the performance is present or not, just about completely eliminating the issue instead of attenuating it only when the performance isn't present. Now, this is just one example of many in which FFT editing could completely change Dynamics processing, but again, it depends on whether or not it's possible. So let me know in the comments if you have any insight on this. Make mixes that accurately translate what you hear in your head, without years of practice or expensive plugins. Seriously though, when people work with us, they get results. That's why major industry professionals like Keith Urban's producer Aaron Schurz works with us, Grammy award-winning AJ Castillo, Billboard number one charted artist Megan Lindsay, Grammy award-winning artist Tulis, The Voice singer Cody Ballou, Grammy-nominated producer Tyler Kane, Warner Music artist Ricky Young, and the list goes on. Why waste your time creating mixes that look like this when you can instantly fix the problem by clicking the link in the description and working directly with professionals who have already done what you're trying to do. We've helped 2,346 clients make mixes that accurately translate what they hear in their heads without years of practice or expensive plugins, and it'll work for you too. Click the link in the description and get direct access to us for custom analog mastering, one-on-one -on -one mixing feedback, in-depth mixing and mastering courses, and our thriving community. Click the link in the description now to start making mixes that accurately translate what you hear in your head.